This meeting is being recorded. Um, well, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there are, what, 10 of us here tonight. There are slightly more than that online, I think. Um, uh, my wife is doing the job of admitting people uh, online, so um, uh, she's looking after us, and she's indeed just starting the recording. Um, so I hope all the, um, all the technicalities will actually work. At this point, over the last day or two, I've actually uh, introduced the speaker, and that sort of seems really a bit pointless somehow. Um, uh, but what I what I would say is just to give the house rules again, uh, to particularly to those online. What on earth is Ted doing? <laughs> Showing picture upon picture there. Um, that was really weird, Ted. That's fascinating. Um, is to uh, if those online please could you make sure you're muted um so that we can't hear you talking um if you want to ask questions and you're online at the end if there are any questions to ask uh, could you put it in the chat function please and then we can pick those up those of you in church uh, can actually of course just uh, raise your hand and i should see it all being well um in as i say i normally give the introduction to the speaker at this point uh, all I would say is that uh, of the five speakers this week, I am the only one whose academic qualifications are in no way related at all to what he's going to be talking about, uh, which you're probably rather glad about, really. Um, um, so I will shortly uh, start the talk when I can see it. Um, Right. Um, uh, I'm hoping everybody can see that. Uh, Ted's waving his hand. Sorry? Okay, well, yeah, good. Um, well, welcome. Uh, I have perhaps the most contrived of titles this week, and I contrived it. St. Michael's Angels, a 19th century clergy and their parish. I have to apologize to Ted in advance. Other people have stood still. I am unable to stand still when I'm talking. So you might need to move it about, Ted, a bit, I fear. Um, the, I want to look at the 19th century clergy. Uh, angels, by definition, are spiritual beings believed to act as an attendant agent or messenger of God, conventionally represented in human form with wings and a long robe. Uh, we have a 19th century clergyman there who's simply lacking the wings. If you want a justification, that's it. But I really just want to talk through St. Michael's uh, during the 19th century and on the looking really at the incumbents, using them as a framework. It's a really interesting century because at the start, you know almost nothing about them. And they come into focus as you go through the century. If we begin, in 1781, the earliest plan of Litchfield. Uh, and you can see St. Michael's in the bottom, bottom right there. Uh, and it is really quite a rural situation. I'll show you a little bigger. Green Hill around it has got some houses, but not that many. And there are fields all around. A very different field to how it would be now. The parish as well was very different. If you look at that map and just see where the words St. Michael occur. And St. Michael occur around here. They go into Street A, as now, uh, Fulfin, right the way across to Burntwood and uh, Woodses, uh, down to Hammerwich, Wall. In the 19th century, that was St. Michael's Parish, almost. Uh, if you pull the focus out a bit, and look at St. Michael's Parish in the bigger picture, you'll see that not only has it got that green area around Litchfield and Burntwood, it also goes out to Fisherwick, Hayeslaw, Statfold, right the way to the, uh, to the east. A huge, huge area. All sorts of speculations about why, I'm not going to go into that today. Um, St. Michael's, 1798, a picture from the William Silk Library from the south side. 
And you notice it's got a door sort of there in the middle on that side. Um, uh, and you might, so there's that door. You might also notice the chancel is the same height as the rest of the building. Yeah, in 1798, not lower like it is now. Right, now come to the clergy. St. Michael's has had a long row of curates or perpetual curates. Perpetual curates, the equivalent of vicars uh, in the early parlance. Uh, and most of them, right through to the late 18th century, are just names. We can say a bit about them. One name I want to talk about, not 19th century, a bit earlier, is Daniel Remington. You'll see why in a moment. He was born in Litchfield. He was actually the grandson of William Baker, the vicar of St. Mary's. Uh, no relation. There were my relatives in, in uh, Litchfield at the time, but they were labourers in Stoke Street. So it, it's rather a different world I, they inhabited than uh, William Baker. Um, and you can see he held a variety of posts. Not only did he hold the perpetual curacy of St. Michael's, he also at the same time was vicar choral at the cathedral. Uh, for part of the time, he was vicar of Harborne and vicar of Alruas. Uh, and then he went on to be a vicar of St. Mary's. But basically, he was a pluralist. He had a number of livings that augmented his salary, and no doubt he hired curates to take the services for him. Remember that name, Remington. Remember it because his son, William Remington, was actually the first 19th century curate at St. Michael's. He was born in Litchfield, he went to St. John's, Cambridge. He was curate at St. Mary's uh, under his father. He became perpetual curate of St. Michael's, which was in the gift of St. Mary's um, uh, in 1781. Uh, that's how they did it in those days. Don't know anything about him really, except that's his tombstone, a uh, memorial in the cathedral, which to my shame I've never seen. This is from a church memorials website. Um, and it says, you won't be able to read it on there, he was the one who instituted Sunday schools in Litchfield, the first who instituted Sunday schools. Um, so a little bit of flesh on the bones there. But I want to just talk briefly, we've got to go too much further, about St. Michael's and how it, the parish and how it developed. We've got some wonderful registers uh, and they can, uh, they have all been digitized and we can look at them in Excel and do all sorts of fancy things with them. And there were about six, six to eight, 60 to 80 baptisms a year, and they all gave parental occupations. And of those, 210 were laborers, 650 I'd call economically inactive, single women, workers, spinsters, and very few baptisms actually to the upper classes in Litchfield. Uh, when you look around at all the monuments here, you think St. Michael's was, you know, a, a place where the upper classes gathered. Those, those statistics don't tell that story. They tell a very different story about a very much a, a local uh, community church uh, and a wide range of occupations. Um, I'm going to show a couple of graphs now. I know not everyone likes graphs. I like graphs. I think graphs are good, uh, but not everyone does. But just a couple to show how things change over the year. That shows in each of the blocks uh, the age at which people died. So 0 to 10, whatever. Uh, and the different lines in the blocks show the different decades in the century. Two things stand out. If you look at the first block, right across the century, there are 25 to 30% of funerals were for kids aged below 10. Hugely different from now. If you look very carefully, you can see another little peak in the early years of around 20. That's women in childbirth, in fact. Uh, but uh, gradually, um, of course, um, it became more and more, it was the older people who were dying. But that's one thing that's very different from now. The other things from the marriage registers. If you look at the marriage registers, again, through the decades, um, basically the, Red line is when both bride and groom signed their name. Uh, and 
The green line is when the groom only signed his name, the blue when the bride only signed her name, and the purple when neither signed their name. And it's the way the red line goes up. You know, what did the Victorians do for us? They gave, taught us to read, gave us literacy, really. And that's change, you know, that is a huge change that was going on during the course of the 19th century. Um, yeah. Okay. The next perpetual curate, guess what his name was? Remington. Guess where he was born and where he went to college? <laughs> Litchfield, St. John's College. Um, he was perpetual curate of St. Chad's uh, during the time of his father, who was also in the living of St. Chad's was in his gift as well. Uh, and he became perpetual curate of St. Michael's and he was here for 26 years. During that time, he did, well, you can see 915 baptisms, uh, 916 marriages and 686 funerals. If you divide it by the number of years, that's not too bad, but it's still a bit eye-watering for any clergy to look at that sort of number. Um, he does have a claim to fame, however, the only claim to fame, uh, in that in 1820, he married Joseph Baker and Jane Walton, my great-great-great-great-grandfather. Uh, and in 1822, he bur buried jo Joseph Baker's father, John, somewhere round there. No, we don't know where his grave is now. Um, and I didn't know that before I came to Litchfield, I had no idea. He had a curate, an assistant curate from 1825 to 1828 that we've been hearing quite a lot about this week, uh, John Louis Petty, uh, who did a lot of paintings. Uh, he was a very, very rich man, actually. He wasn't a bit rich. He was very, very rich. Uh, and some of his paintings there, I think, Particularly, his paintings of the Black Country are really of major historical significance because he's showing in the Black Country, well, he almost depicts the Black Country ironworks as the equivalent of churches, which is amazing, really. Uh, but some of the things he paints, they're the earliest representations of those things. They're really quite, quite important uh, in historical terms. That guy there, John Louis, uh, Louis Hayes Petty was actually his uncle. And um, he, again, was also extremely rich. Um, one of the curates was a guy called Tom Nossel Parr, born in Litchfield, went to St. John's College, Cambridge. Um, and he, um, was a, he was a curate here to Remington from 1828 to 1831. He followed on from John Louis Petty. And he became perpetual curate from 1831 to 1868. And he was the first rector, the rec first rector of St. Michael's in 1868. And he basically had one job. He was, he was a, a priest vicar at the cathedral, which no doubt augmented his living a little bit. Um, he's strangely silent in the record though. You'll see lots was going on during his time here but we don't hear much about him at all, really. Um, in 1833, that's St. Michael's from Sturgeon's Hill. Okay. Uh, that's the way you came to church today, Leslie Ray, okay? Uh, it is weird, isn't it? Uh, that's St. Michael's from Sturgeon's Hill. Um, oops, sorry about that. Oh, no. Over the course of... Um, the next few years, the parish started to shrink. And it started to shrink for the best of reasons and for the worst of reasons. The first bit to go was Burntwood. Burntwood, there was a growing population uh, and um, there was an appeal to build a church there. The dean of the cathedral said something like, we must build a church, otherwise they will be prey to the worst of the sectarians. I think he meant the primitive Methodists, okay? And I find it the biggest irony that what a hung, uh, almost 200 years later, uh, a talk can be given by a minister of St. Michael's who was brought up in a primitive Methodist chapel. Uh, the sectarians have won, okay? Uh, so Christchurch Burntwood, that area split off first of all. Then Hazelaw, Hazelaw out to the east wasn't so nice. They actually, uh, 
St. Michael's Church Wardens and Hayes Law went to law about the church rate. And eventually they became extra parochial. Basically, St. Michael's was, uh, uh, wardens were charging a rate and for the maintenance at St. Michael's and not for Hayes Law Chapel. Hammerwich, similarly, uh, major arguments about money and resource. You know, what's, what's new, really, what is new? Uh, and they split off in 1842. Wall, less so, there was a grant for a church um, and from Mr. Mott of the Mott Room, uh, and uh, the new church was built at Wall. Christ Church was the next to go in the 1848, and sometime undefined later in the century, Stapville seems to have wandered off by itself. I can't quite make out where and how it went, but it, uh, by the end it wasn't there. So the parish shrank right down over 20 years, really. Um, and that must have been quite a traumatic time in some ways because there was money coming in from these places uh, to St. Michael's. The tithe map of 1847, the tithe computation map shows uh, Green Hills getting busier. You can see more houses around it, uh, around St. Michael's Church. Um, the area to the bottom left is Cherry Orchard. And that was basically allotment garden, uh, market gardens. It was the breadbasket of Litchfield, really, that area. And you can see on the uh, top right, the workhouse had arrived. Uh, it was the union workhouse pulling in the poor from Rugeley and Litchfield and the surrounding areas. And it's still there, of course. Um, that's part of the Samuel Johnson. Um, in the, that should be late 1830s, not late 1803s. However many times you read it through, you, you miss it. Um, two, two pictures of the church. Notice again, the high chancel there we've got. Also notice that, that's the Donegal tomb. The Donegals of Fisherwick uh, were for a generation or two really quite important people. Uh, and they had their, they built their own tomb basically just out there. And there were several generations found within it. However, uh, by the 1840s, the church was in some state of disrepair and uh, repairs needed to be done but much more than repairs were done. Uh, it was decided by the powers that be that it should be rebuilt in the Gothic style. Um, and I'm sure John Louis Petty would have had words to say about that. Um, two internal pictures in the early 1840s, one looking from the door, sort of up this way. Uh, and the fascinating thing is, can you make it out in the, between the arches, is a three-decker pulpit reading desk up there. And the second one is actually looking out of the chancel, uh, that away, sort of, and there were pews there. You know, the focus of the church was sort of over there, which is odd, very odd, uh, to our minds at any rate. The church warden was somebody called Richard Green, who was the grandson of another Richard Green, who was uh, quite notable in Litchfield and has got all sorts of memorials to him. And he wrote to William Salt of the William Salt Library about the chancel of St. Michael's as it was, a hideous and unnecessary aftergrowth, so substantial a deformity. It seems a bit of a strong way of putting it really, uh, but that's how they felt about it. So they decided to do something about it. As they're doing something about it, they found, of course, our little effigy um, of a medieval tomb. Um, the first donor, if you like, or someone who left a bequest to the church was one William de Walton. And the name William de Walton has become associated with that. It may or may not be. There's no direct, um, direct connection. But it's rather nice. If you don't know it, go and have a look at his little dock. It's rather pretty. Afterwards, that's what it looks like. You can see the chancel was lowered again. Um, there were all sorts of wholly unnecessary structural 
not structurally unnecessary buttresses put up on that side. Um, the window, which was something like it is now, was actually um, made into lancet windows at some horrible cost of medieval glass. Um, I'm not sympathetic, you will judge, I'm not sympathetic. And there was a vaulted roof, plastered walls. Uh, and if you look at the chancel, it's very different. You see no choir stalls, little altar, I think, at the top end. I'm a bit puzzled by that. I'll say why in a minute or two. Uh, but a very different feel, very different feel. And you can see we've got the first vestry in the, in the picture there. Let's go back to Richard Green. Um, Richard Green was the church warden. And during the renovation, he put up a, a monument on that side of the chancel to his grandfather, the Richard Green of Litchfield fame, whom I show there. He also took the opportunity to uh, build a family tomb underneath the chancel. And every time we walk up to um, walk up to communion, or used to walk up to communion up there, we walk over that bit of stone on the right that's got the initials of several greens there. Pretty clever building your own crypt, really, when you're doing that. I hate to be cynical. But, um, a bit later, 1858, the rectory came. They're obviously not 1858 photographs. It's not an 1858 bus stop on that one. Um, um, uh, but some of you will remember that, of course. Um, around that time as well, Chancellor Thomas Law, frequented this church, a chancellor of the cathedral, master of St. John's, um, founder of the theological college or that sort of thing, and his tomb still exists. It's a registered ancient monument, of course. There are other interesting folk. One guy that particularly interests me is a guy called William Durad. William Durad was Litchfield's first station master. He was a station master at Litchfield Trent Valley. He came from very humble origins, and he became church warden, and we say there a page of his writing in the church warden's accounts of the 1850s. And his grave, if you know where to look, you can still find it in the churchyard, that's the bottom right. And indeed, in, we have full details of his funeral, what the choir sang and everything, because it was all in the paper. The thing that particularly intrigues me about this is on just down here, you might have seen, sorry to, these are memorial tiles to Bishop Lonsdale and Bishop Selwyn. And they're sort of triangular. And I show them on the bottom right, bottom left there. Over here, there are three memorial tiles to the Durads, uh, put in about 40 years later. And I could only think that his family placing them there opposite the bishops were trying to make a point. That's all I can think about. Again, you can call me cynical if you will, but that's, that's the way I would interpret it. So we come on to 1862 um, for another drawing. You can see the avenue of trees still there. Uh, some things have changed. The uh, South Staffordshire Railway is now coming up by the side of the churchyard. Um, and the school is there. So the first building of St. Michael's School in 1858. Thomas Nossel Parr, not a mention in the records. He, he, he must have been there and seen all these things and influenced them, but we don't hear anything of him at all. Um, we see something of him. You may or may not be able to read that. That's the 1861 census when we find him living with his sister, who he never married, uh, and one, uh, one servant at the new rectory there. So he comes, in a way, to life. It's about that point, really. Um, oops, sorry. Um, his grave is down there, the par grave. It's gr a grave of many of his family. But these figures, these figures I find simply eye-watering. In the course of his tenure, he did 1,866 baptisms, 3,168 marriages, and 780 funerals. I cannot comprehend that. <laughs> I struggle to do a funeral a month, I have to say. <laughs> so, uh, just an amazing number. If you look at the registers, they come up almost on a daily basis. 
I guess the funerals would have been at the graveside, they would have been fairly standard. But nonetheless, amazing, really. He died. The next clergyman we know somewhat more about. He comes a bit more to life. Uh, James Jordan Sargentson, born in Nutty Ash. Different. Um, uh, he went to Liverpool and rugby schools. And he went to Trinity College, Cambridge. So he moved just down the road in Cambridge terms. He was a curate at Stoke-on-Trent for many years and obviously a well-regarded curate. And he became St. Michael's uh, from 1868 until his death. And he married Elizabeth Buckley um, and they had five children in total. He was a rowing blue. You can see there's a bit more to his character. He, he rowed for Cambridge in the 1857 boat race. It won't have been a terribly happy experience because in that boat race, Cambridge lost by the 11th greatest margin in the entire history of the boat race. Uh, so it, was, it would have been a bit grim. I doubt he would have liked remembering it really, but nonetheless, he did. When he came to the parish, within months, year of coming to the parish, he was a, being awarded a prize for the best variegated geraniums a flower show. Now, you can imagine how that went down with the locals. The vicar comes in and wins a prize. You know, I'm, you know that, that's the thing. Um, he was actually quite a rounded guy. Um, he had a number of curates, one of them, several interesting ones, but one of them was Reverend John Still. I mentioned him because last week there was the 150th anniversary of the martyrdom of Bishop John Patterson in 1871 in the Solomon Islands uh, of the Melanesia mission. John Still um, uh, actually uh, went not quite from here, but not long. He went from here uh, to Wolverhampton for a while and then went out to the Melanesian mission. And that should be, oh, mistake after mistake, I'm appalled. Melanesian mission, 1873 to 1879. And then he became vicar of the Pro Cathedral in Wellington. And then he came back home. Um, I would suggest it must have taken a bit of courage when you know that your bishop's just been martyred to actually go out, go out there. He was accurate. One of the tragic events that Sargentson saw uh, was a major fire and you can see you can see where that is in the literature, in Brett Market Street. I think it's Brett Market Street there. Um, uh, the little house um, next to the coffee shop. In 1873, there was a major fire there. And three adults and five children all died. They were Catholics. Um, uh, and so the funeral was held at the Catholic church, but they were buried in St. Michael's churchyard. And we read something of it here. Um, the Reverend J.J. Sargentson meeting the cortege and proclaiming the inspired opening sentences of the burial service. The coffins were taken out of the hearses and placed side by side at the foot of the grave. The mourners were ranged around. Every head was bowed and in a silence broken only by occasional sobs, the Reverend gentleman gave out the 90th Psalm. His voice trembled with emotion as he declared how in the morning man's life is green and groweth up, but in the evening it is cut down. Uh, Sargentson was visibly upset by that. It must have been a hugely draining emotional time for him. The, um, the uh, stone is still in the churchyard down there. Um, something of his ecclesiastical position can be found in the fact that he was signed a petition against legalizing Eucharistic vestments under the eastward position. Um, at that time, I guess most clergy would have said communion on the north side of the altar. Indeed, that's how the vicar I was born, brought up with, well, how I, when I first became an Anglican, how he celebrated. Um, and, um, which probably says something about my original churchmanship, I shouldn't really say to the bishop, but that's, that's you know, he'll know, he'll know. Uh, but he was against it. Uh, and he, he, you can see his name there. 
And that puzzles me when you look at that old picture, picture of the chancel, how you celebrate North Side on that altar as it was. I just don't know. I don't know. It puzzles me. It puzzles me. But he was clearly what you might call a Protestant in these terms, but a Protestant who over the course of his tenure, the worship became more and more Eucharistic as he went through. It was quite interesting. June 77 in the service book. This is the thousandth time I have preached in this church. Okay. Um, I, heartfelt. Um, in 1878, he baptized one Walter Durad. You remember Durad, the Litchfield station master? He was the grandson of William Durad. William Durad went on to the Melanesian mission again, and he actually became quite a significant anthropologist. Uh, writing books such as The Attitude of the Church to the Suke, which are the inhabitants of the Torres Straits Islands. Uh, and he, uh, his work is still quoted in anthropological terms. He became quite an important guy. So that's him there. Okay. So another link with the Melanesian mission, and perhaps a bit, bit uh, more remote, this one. Um, again, the 1881 census we see there. Um, uh, James Jordan uh, Sargent and his wife and his um, one, two, three, five children there. Actually, there was a sixth, I should have mentioned, who died not long after they came here and is buried in the churchyard. And they have four servants there. So number of servants has increased. Um, Holy Week 1882. I mean, you're not going to go through that. Um, that's the um, time that's that's in the service books, just straight out of the service books for the uh, for the um, for the church, and you can see over the course of the week how many services he took he took and, and the and the sermons he preached at every one of them. That is again quite staggering. Uh, how long he preached for? How good they were? Who knows? But nonetheless, he. He was very conscientious in preaching the word and in, and in the worship of the church, very conscientious. He also played the bells. And these are just pictures taken from the belfry of, um, of times when he played, in, in played the bells. In a, a complete peal of uh, plain bot minor, a complete peal of grandsire minor uh, and another one. Can't quite read it. Sorry, but uh, but um, he was a, an accomplished bell ringer. I know nothing about bell ringing. I, I really don't. Uh, so I'm not going to say any more and embarrass embarrass myself. Um, by 1882, here again we see the first ordnance survey map. See how much busier it's getting around around St. Michael's now, there, much busier. And the school's there. Uh, the school is uh, now got two buildings, uh, one bit from 1858 that's now the girls' school and one bit from 1859 that's the boys' school. Uh, but that's not the final form yet. June 1883, <laughs> uh, this is a 2000th time I have preached. Um, he died relatively young. I don't know why. Uh, I, I could find out by going for his death certificate, but actually, I, it might sound a bit bizarre. It actually feels a bit intrusive to do that to somebody else, uh, to look at his death certificate. Um, he has a monument up there. The fountain down at the bottom of Green Hill is also there in his memory, and we can see his grave is out there in perhaps the wildest and most overgrown bit of the churchyard. And I haven't been able to find it. Indeed, I haven't been able to get near it because you either get your legs scratched or you ruin a pair of trousers trying to get, get into it. Uh, and that seems a bit sad, really. Um, he did 1,123 1, baptisms, 1,189 marriages, and 215 funerals. No, not so many. He wasn't there so long. Um, and he was followed by Cyril Edgerton Hubbard, born in Kensington, 
He went to Eton College in the day when being an Old Etonian was respectable. Um, uh, but he also went to St. John's College, Cambridge, again. Um, he was a curate in suburban parishes in London before coming to St. Michael's, and he stayed for seven years. He and his wife, Agnes, had two children. When he came, he instituted a cricket team. And here we have a report of a match between St. Michael's and St. Chad's. And this is embarrassing. It really is embarrassing. It's a, a two innings match. It would all be played on one day. Goodness knows what the pitches were like. Uh, and St. Michael scored 13 in the first innings and 31 in the second. And St. Chad scored 100 in their first innings. So to me, that means St. Chad won by an innings and 56 runs. Um, uh, Reverend C. Hubbard played and he was LBW for naught in the first innings. Um, he took a wicket, uh, he bowled somebody, uh, and then he was run out for 12, top scoring at 12 in the second innings. Oddly, that's the only report of the St. Michael's cricket team that exists. Can't think why, can't think why. Um, St. Michael's school achieved its fairly final form by the infilling of various buildings around then. And we re do read in the press for both James Sargentson and Cyril Hubbard, they were very involved with the school and with the national schools in general. Uh, and that was a, obviously something that they took very, very seriously. The 1891 census, here we have Cyril and his wife and children, and this time five servants. Um, he was a very, very wealthy man, uh, without a doubt. Um, but it's not how clergy live these days. One thing he did was to uh, organize the uh, taking down of much of the Gothic uh, stuff that had been put up in the chancel. He removed the roof, gave, put the roof back to how it was, took the plaster off the walls, um, and actually knocked out the Lancet windows found that the frame of the old window still existed and effectively reinstated the window there, not as it was. And not during his time, but after that, the choir stalls were added and we can see, uh, see two pictures. The picture on the right is one of Maureen's and it's uh, actually uh, looking down from the top altar. And I find that an incredibly evocative picture in some way. I think it's lovely. That one. Um, he paid for that out of his own pocket. Um, he cared that deeply, uh, I think, for, the, for what he was doing. Um, not so many, only th mere 1,360 baptisms, 164 marriages and 66 funerals. He's the only one from rector of the time who actually didn't die here. <laughs> Um, he, he seemed to move out of parish ministry. There's no record of him. You know, again, you might say St. Michael's just proved too much for him. I don't know. Um, but we do read, of, and he do read of him as a chaplain at various European resorts uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and the last of the 19th century ones, oh, he broke the mold, didn't he? Born in Northumberland, Otto Steele, went to Trinity College, Dublin. Okay. Um, he would curate vicar of loads of places, becoming rural dean of Newcastle, that's our Newcastle, over in Stoke. Uh, and when he came to St. Michael's, he was a hugely experienced clergyman. He was, you know, uh, very, very experienced. Uh, he married Flora, I think, can't quite get the record straight, and they had a couple of children. Flora, it was certainly Flora, but Flora, I don't know what, because they were married in Ceylon. Can't, can't find it out. Um, I just put it here, Litchfield Mercury, October the 5th, 1894. And it's of a service where the preacher was Reverend Canon Lonsdale, who I think was Vicar of St. Mary's at the time, and uh, the, vec the rector, Reverend Otto Steele, is mentioned. The bit I really like in this press report, and that my reason for putting it here is, uh, I'll read this. The services were admirably rendered by the choir in connection with which there has been a considerable improvement. Uh, damning with faint praise, really, there. But, you know, 
Wonderful, wonderful. Um, it gives us the first view around then of the services in the church. Um, we have here the very first parish magazines you can get hold of. And you can see what, what they were like. Um, Holy Communion early, a morning service, almost certainly matins. Uh, Holy Communion at 12 o'clock after the morning service. And I still remember that pattern uh, from some churches I've seen to. Sunday school in the afternoon, girls' Bible class. Uh, Sunday 3.15, baptisms and churchings. Again, churchings. I just about remember them, but not really. And an evening service. Evening services up till the 1890s, no, the 1870s, sorry, when gas was first introduced, only happened in June, July, and August. That was the only, only time evening services happened. And services on Wednesday and on Friday as well. Uh, you know, really very full program that we have there of services. Uh, and we can see uh, Otto Steele obviously leads, led a very much more modest lifestyle uh, than, his, um, uh, than his predecessors, and just him and his wife and one servant uh, in the vicarage, in the rectory in 1901. Um, in 1902, we can now see um, St. Michael's School there, all the bits joined up. Uh, it, so that is St. Michael's School and, Sun, Summit and Sunday School, almost as it was until it was shut there. Um, Otto Steele is buried in the churchyard. He has a memorial in the chancel again, and his grave is quite visible and just over there. So that's my very quick tour of the 19th century St. Michael's and their rectors. Oh, sorry, uh, 797 baptisms, 659 marriages, 201 funerals. Anglican angels? I don't know. I don't know. All I would say, they were deeply embedded in their community. Um, at least two of them uh, were highly regarded enough to have memorials put up in church for them. Um, they were assiduous in their, in their practice, in their services, and they carrying out the um, pastoral services for the parish. And in one case, uh, they gave an awful lot of money to the place because of their care for it. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt as angels, I think. Um, doesn't quite end there. Tomorrow night, Ted is going to speak to us. And he's going to speak about the Angel of Mons, spirituality in the Great War. And one of the people he's going to be talking about is the next rector, Percival Howard, who was there for uh, 29 years, spanning the First and Second World Wars. And he too has a story to tell that I'm sure uh, Ted will tell us about tomorrow night, amongst other things. It's not just that, I think. So I'm stopping, stopping the share now. Um, and what I think I'll do is I'll go on to gallery view. Um, so I should be able to see most of the people uh, who are online, not all of them. Most of, uh, no, most of them have wisely kept their, uh, kept their um, camera off. Um, do you have any questions, folks? Um, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. David. Right. Um, the a perpetual curate, we call them the vicar. Right. So a rector had certain privileges in terms of um, uh, in terms of the the power and the freehold of the land that they had. A perpetual curate effectively had a, a job for life, but it was a job that was sort of paid for and he didn't have all the rights and responsibilities. And just as perpetual curate vicars and rectors sort of merged these days, it, it began to get that way over the course of the 19th century and perpetual curates were gradually phased out over that time. I don't know how long they went on. Uh, I'm really trying not to ask Bishop Michael to ask some of these things because I'm sure he knows more than I do. Uh, but they sort of faded out over, uh, over that time. But they were our equivalent of vicars, really. So they were the minister here. Really. Maureen.
Say, say, that, say that again. Oh, no, no, no. I, I think the, the Remingtons, for example, they're a well-established clerical family. They would have made a lot of their money from a lot, holding a lot of livings together. Um, James Sargentson, uh, sorry, Nossal Parr was actually the son of a lawyer. So a well-to-do middle-class man. James Sargentson similarly was a, a well-to-do middle-class man. Uh, Cyril Hubbard, I don't know, but obviously very wealthy. Otto Steele, I don't think particularly so. In fact, I think he was, uh, you know, he's obviously very bright, but I don't think he was particularly wealthy. Uh, uh, yeah, the, they, again, speaking really about stuff I don't know, but the fees that came through funerals and the like were shared between uh, the parish and, and the rector. And the, up until the 18th, 1830s, um, basically each living was endowed with a certain amount of money. Uh, so the bigger livings had more money and they were the ones you wanted to get. Um, the, when tithes were commuted in the 1830s and the ecclesiastical commission was set up, that started the process of leveling up the salaries. But it took many years after that before it actually happened. Bishop Michael. I could actually, I could actually say quite a bit about it, which I deliberately, deliberately took out. Um, the the workhouse had had its own chaplain, right? uh, and that chaplain uh, was responsible for the spiritual welfare of the of the workhouse inhabitants, and did all the all the baptisms. And the baptism would be mainly of illegitimate children. But all those baptisms were recorded in the register of St. Michael's. Um, so, um, and we often see the workhouse chaplains preaching at St. Michael's as well. And there's, there's interchange. All the burials were in the churchyard. Um, some taken by the incumbent, some taken by the workhouse chaplain. I think almost without exception, the perpetual curate or rectors at St. Michael's were on the were trustees of the workhouse so there were there was a great deal of interaction at that level now quite how that worked out in the community i don't know because i suspect it wasn't a whole you know, they would have been a, a community within a community that might not be fully accepted and the records don't really tell you that very much um but the whole issue of the workhouse um, I mean, and I know it happened in the Merc you can read about it unless your Mercury is anywhere else. Um, it was paradoxically, the kids in the workhouse would get tended to get a better education than the children in the parish because that's what they paid a teacher for to teach in the workhouse. And people couldn't square this, and they were they were talking about degrading the education in the workhouse because it wasn't fair. Yeah, very odd, very odd. I don't know whether that really answers the question, but you know, it's, it, there was a lot of interaction, um, and you can you can see it when people, you know, the cross on the on in the registers and in the service books as well. Is there anything from folks online? Uh, if there is, show it, throw it up in chat. Well, there's silence, but that's. Um, Probably to the good. Um, I think I will therefore leave it there. Oh, right, right. Oh, you might. Yeah. Dr. James would say he did. Um, however, is he online? I'm not sure. Um, um, however, <laughs> uh, I am I am not wholly convinced because on some of the uh, on on the tithe map, for example, uh, which 
just predates the coming of the railway. The land to that side of the current churchyard boundary, to the railway boundary, is fields. Now, that doesn't mean it was never part of the churchyard, because the churchyard was largely, uh, largely a, a settlement for uh, uh, largely used for grazing the cattle uh, in the early days. Uh, but certainly at that point, it looks to me as if it were fields, and those fields weren't owned by the church. You can get that from the tithe register, which suggests to me that, no, it wasn't. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but uh, you probably, I probably need to do a bit more looking into, um, uh, in, into the details. There is something come up on chat. Uh, are there any other connections you know of with the coming of the railway and St. Michael's? Who's that from? Richard. Yeah, I thought it might be. Hi, Richard. <laughs> um, uh, only in the most general sense, I think, in that um, you can read of many railway labourers and railway workers who were baptised married or buried. Um, I can't think of any more specific things. What I can, I can, sorry, one thing. And this will inter uh, interest the railway nerds, I've completely forgotten about it. Um, in the 1880s, I can't find it more precisely than that. Um, St. Michael's choir went on a uh, choir trip to Fandutno. And to do so, they hired a railway carriage. And this railway carriage was delivered to Litchfield Trent Valley for them. They all got into it, and then a train, presumably the other carriages, came on, shunted, and took them to hand at now. I think they must have had two or three engines during the course of it. Uh, that was fairly common at the time, but a, a nice way of getting there. So they just all got onto their carriage, and ended up in fact to know a little while later. Right, so that, that's one that Ted, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure where the Dean's patronage comes from I have to say Ted because in the 19th century the patronage was with the Vicar of St Mary's now at some stage I don't quite know how it got to the chapter it, it, there's something there I don't know um, but you can see from the jobs that the clergy at St Michael's tended in the 7th, 18th and 9th, early 19th century to have uh, to be priest vicars at the cathedral or vicars of the prebends of the cathedral uh, or to hold prebendaries themselves and they would have been more than the titular ones that our last rector held I think they would have been real real things that came with real money uh, so there would have been interaction there and we know going further back uh, the, into the 17th and 18th centuries, then it was the job of the Prebends to provide preachers to St. Michael's, even when St. Michael's had curates. Uh, and there's a classic tale that's in all the guidebooks that um, there was a, a disagreement at some point uh, between the church wardens of St. Michael's and the Prebends because the Prebends wanted to drive a carriage up to the door of St. Michael's because they didn't wish to walk. Uh, the uh, church wardens told them, we're not allowing that, you can't possibly pop your carriage just outside. Uh, and it got to the stage where the prebend said, okay then, here's our vicar, he's, he's coming with a sermon he'll read out. And it actually took the dean of the cathedral to sort that out, basically intervened. So, but I, that whole relationship, how it developed, I just don't know. I don't know how the dean and the chapter became our patrons. I don't know whether you know any more. <laughs> oh, I see. So uh, perhaps at that, that perhaps when the rector, perhaps when he became a rectory. Okay, fine. Yeah, okay. I should have picked that out, but clearly, I don't know the lot really. Um, I don't think there are any more questions online. My family's history.
Any more out there? No? In that case, then, thank you very much indeed. And I look forward to hearing Ted tomorrow evening. Thank you. <laughs>